We've been in Kibbeth for a couple of years, but uh, I retired from being Bishop of Norwich in 1985, my dear, a long time ago, and then we rushed off and ran a country parish because we'd never had a country parish before, although I had, I had 550 in, Nor in Norfolk, which we had to look after. But, uh, and, and so we ran this little parish as, as the local parson after my retirement and enjoyed that very much. Then we came back to Enfield in North London to be near our son John, who's a clergyman in Tottenham, and I used to help him with services there. And then finally, about a couple of years ago, uh, in our ancient years, we decided we'd retire to this clergy home for decayed and elderly clergy. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, he's just said that you're decayed. Now, what do you think about that? Well, it's a, a real bit of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that you were decayed at all. Um, so, you're enjoying your retirement. Uh, you liked the country parish. And it must have been a very different existence from being a bishop with all, all your yes, finery yes. to the country parish. Yes, it was, but we enjoyed it. Oh, I was in addition an assistant bishop of Oxford and used to take confirmations and occasionally what are called institutions, putting in new vigours, for the bishop of Oxford. And when I came back to London, they made me an assistant bishop of London and uh, so I used to do confirmations and uh, bishop services for the Bishop of London, who has an enormous area to cover. Because, you see, technically, you don't stop being a bishop till you die. You first become a deacon uh, when you are first ordained, and I was ordained uh, just after Mr. Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was there just in time for the London Blitz, and so I was a curate in the London Blitz, and then uh, from there uh, we went on uh, a year later to be ordained priest, which is the second order in the church, and then later on, uh, also in St Paul's Cathedral, I was made a bishop in 1971. But then you don't stop being a bishop, so you go on doing bishoply things if they ask you to, but also, because you're also a priest, are you able to help with services? And strangely enough, only uh, recently I was doing the service of accession from the prayer book, which is the special service to be used every year on February the 6th, which is the day of the Queen's accession. And so I was doing those special prayers in chapel here at Kibbeth. So it's not a position that you take on lightly as a bishop. If, if it, is, it literally is a lifelong job. It is. It is a lifelong job. And I've actually enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, it, it's been many happy years. But, of course, uh, and this is where there'll be a snort, uh, but I could not have done it without the support and care of Margaret, my wonderful wife. And he said that with such a smile on his face. <laughs> but Margaret, I mean, it is true, when you, when you are a bishop's wife, you are literally working full-time too, aren't you? Yes. yes, exactly. But the nice thing about Norfolk was that I, the bishop's wife wasn't expected to do anything. So I had a, a, a choice. I could do what I wanted. And so, what did you do? Oh, I went all over the diocese. I, I liked Sing. speaking. I liked singing, and so when I spoke, I always asked them if they would like me to sing, and usually they said yes, so I used to sing something like a Negro spiritual, or even when I spoke of marriage, I, say, I sang that song, Can't Help Loving That Man of Mine, and there's a special bit about even his kisses smell of gin, and as Morris is a teetotaler, that all the, the people giggled. <laughs> you mentioned being the Bishop of, of Norwich, Morris. A great job in that because it brought you into close contact with the royal family, didn't yes. it? Well, because you'll see Sandringham is in the diocese. And uh, so although we know nothing about what will happen when we become a bishop, it's a complete shock when we get a letter from the Prime Minister saying, uh, after much consideration, uh, we would like to put your name forward to the Crown uh, for appointment as Bishop, in this case Bishop of Norwich, we know that it's already gone to the Queen <laughs> to see if she thinks he'll be all right for whatever you're appointed. In our case, not every diocese, 
But in our diocese, the Queen knows about it. And I happen to know, and from, of course, getting to know her well later on, that, uh, that she did know that it was me that was coming to be her, her bishop. So, really, you got the royal seal of approval before you even got to Norwich? <laughs> well, sort of, yes. Margaret will tell you about how when uh, the great visit of the Queen here to Leicester, at the very end of her great tour, uh, 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 the Golden Jubilee tour, that tour. was at the Space Centre, wasn't yes, it? Space Centre. Yes, Margaret, I understand that she specially asked to see you two. Yeah. You're quite right. Yes, we got a great surprise when we were asked to lunch with the Queen. And then when we got in, actually we were both in wheelchairs. We weren't very well. We stood up and so forth. Uh, we got a message from one of these high officials that the Queen wanted to speak to us before she spoke to all the procession of important people, really important people. <laughs> so when she came, she came straight to us, but we were standing in a special place, and the first thing that we saw was the Queen on her own coming round a corner. She, she, yes, she looked almost lost, but when she saw Morris and me, she put her arms out, and I really thought she was about to kiss Morris. <laughs> Morris, a kiss from the Queen. Did she actually do it? No, no. She put her arms out and gave us a great welcome. And Margaret is most unwise to tell the story to the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, we not many people can well. say that. No. Yes, you do know her well. Um, what was it like being with the Queen so much at Sandringham and seeing her family grow up? Well, I think that of the family, I knew young Prince Andrew, Duke of York. I knew Prince Andrew best of them all, and I knew them all, of course. Um, uh, but uh, Andrew was about 12 when we first got there. Charles had very sweetly given him a gold post as his Christmas present. Uh, Andrew got me out in the ground at Sandrium uh, while he was in goal, and I had to keep trying to score, and he kept trying to save, save the goal. And so we had great fun with him. And the nice thing is that when he was only about 13, or 13, we took him to his first ever football match, Norwich City Football Club. My Canaries uh, were ha playing against Chelsea, which happened to be the Queen Mother's team. And uh, <laughs> she liked Chelsea. They were playing at Carrow Road. And he came to tea with us and with all the children. In fact, uh, he had great fun playing with Jane's pussy. And uh, then we took him off to, 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 to Carrow Road, and we had a great time with him watching the game. And the nice thing was, the Queen is so careful that one of the footmen at Sandringham, who was madly pro the Canaries, had lent him a Norwich City Canaries tie, which he'd put on. And the Queen made him put his jersey up high here so that it wouldn't show, so that he wasn't seen supporting one particular team on, on the royal family. Fancy thinking of that. It just shows you how careful she has to be. You, you mentioned the photographs here. You've, there's loads of photographs around your apartment. Um, there's a lovely one here. You're standing on the steps with the Queen Mother. What, what occasion was that? Uh, that was when I was principal of Oak Hill Theological College, one of the college's training men to be clergymen uh, in the Church of England. And we also had quite a lot of students who were married uh, 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 older students who came to be ordained a little late in life and so we had just built a lovely new set of student wives uh, well uh, accommodation family accommodation and uh, we got the Queen Mother to come and uh, open this for us in fact this must have been the first time I suppose looking back that we got to know the royal family in a personal way and uh, we had a lovely service there and Margaret will tell you, if she mightn't tell you, but she might tell you about the famous pot of tea. She had a beautiful Sèvres uh, teapot that her mother had given her, and this had been a pride and joy to us. And so Margaret decided that we must use the Sèvres teapot for pouring out the tea for the Queen I, Mother. I sense a story coming up. So what happened, Margaret? <laughs> well, I poured out the Queen Mother's cup of tea first. 
I, I put the leaves in it and got it all right, and the cream was sitting at a little table, and when I poured out the tea, out came all the tea leaves. And I simply, d I didn't simply know what to do. I was absolutely panicked, <laughs> and I actually handed it to her. <laughs> <laughs> but did she drink? <laughs> well, she pretended to drink it, but I really think, don't think it was, it was a good cup of tea at all. Oh, whoops. There's a lo another lovely photo. Let's have a look at this one. Now, this is one, uh, it's a black and white picture of you with the Queen. You are resplendent in your bishop's um, robe. Yes, well, what this picture, this is the great, the great gateway of Norwich Cathedral here. Here are my suffragan or assistant bishops behind me here. I'm wearing a wonderful bishop's cope. Now, I didn't like wearing a mitre very much. Uh, I thought it ra rather show-off, but you can hardly say this isn't show-off, the actual cope. <laughs> well, it's a black and white photograph, but it does look very lavish. Is there well, gold is, in there? It's, it's a wonderful cloth of gold uh, cope uh, given to the Bishop of Norwich for use, and it's there still, it's still used by the present Bishop of Norwich, with a wonderful great gold and green back, back, back to it. And, and here in my hand is the great silver staff, which again is the possession of the Bishop of Norwich. Um, and so we were receiving the Queen here with her famous handbag here. And the joke was that uh, she arrived we were all were nervously standing there waiting, and she arrived a little late, and so she came up to me. In fact, the Lord Mayor was over here, and the Dean was over here, and they were the uh, official welcomers before we led her into the cathedral. But because she knew me, she saw me, and she came across to me, and just this picture of her talking to me and me talking to her, this was when she said, I'm so sorry, we're a bit late, Bishop, but um, when we flew up here, we couldn't get out onto the central runway. She was in one of the fl flight, the royal flights, and uh, she said that uh, it was very difficult, she said, because I couldn't get out and get away, because I don't think they knew who we were, she said. <laughs> Well, that's quite a story. You used to stay at Standringham with the with the royal family, well, didn't you? It's the the lovely, it's the nicest job in the whole Church of England, being Bishop of Norwich, because the tradition is that because you're the local bishop, you are invited to preach on the Sunday after Christmas every year. After which, a string of important bishops from other dioceses and archbishops and the rest, they come in the next four weeks because the Queen's always four weeks at Sandringham after Christmas but I always preach the first and so I preached every year whereas the other bishop only got one time and were terribly nervous all through and then nervously went home again I had the fun of knowing what it was going to be like and Margaret would come across and be present and we would all have coffee after the service at the rectory this whole weekend I stayed there myself with the royal family so I got to know them all well and I got to know the particularly very nice um, lemon drink, which uh, is always issued to you. And as Margaret was saying, I was rather a teetotal in those days. I'm not quite so teetotal now as I was then, but I was then. I remember one particular, rather sad really, I remember one particular evening meal when I was sitting on the Queen's right hand, and dear Princess Diana was sitting on my left hand. And I remember Princess Diana saying to me then that her favourite hymn was I Vow to Thee, My Country. So I knew her well as well. A much misunderstood girl? I think so. She was a lovely person. Really, really lovely. All this stuff, but not sure how much the Queen liked her. The Queen loved her dearly, and she loved the Queen. I can see them standing there, because, of course, Diana was very tall, and she would stand almost like a stalk above the Queen, and the Queen looking up to her and talking, and they would have great times together. At other meals, I found myself sitting between the Queen and the Queen Mother, uh, which was rather fun. And I would say grace, and I would always keep 
uh, copies of the grace that I used. Uh, there was a special royal grace which I discovered had been used in the days of Queen Elizabeth I, 400 years before, and I used to use that grace sometimes. Um, and then we had a nice grace which said, we thank you for the gift of food in the hungry world, the gift of friendship in a lonely world, and in a disturbed world, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Very fond memories indeed of your time as, as the Bishop of Norwich. Um, we were looking at your photographs and your very, very vivid costumes. Not so well dressed today. What I mean is very casually dressed. You've got a fleece on. Yes, because I went ahead to go across the doctor this morning because my ankles are hurting. Oh. And so I'm still wearing this rather jolly fleece jacket. You're also still wearing a cross. Yes, yes, this is my bishop's cross. And uh, I'm very fond of it because it's a, a Celtic cross. And the fact that your name is Bridget, my dear, and my family came from County Cork in the south of Ireland, meant that you and I are obviously friends from the word go. Uh, <laughs> and my, my lovely wild Irish South of Ireland father came across to England before I was born. But the Celtic cross, I'm holding it here, has all the lovely marks of the Celtic cross along it. And um, then the, the round circle there, which is the cross of glory, reminding us that the cross tells us that Jesus loved us enough to die for us, and the ring of glory, that he rose from the dead, conquered death, is alive today, so we can trust him as our personal friend and saviour, and that's lovely. So I'm very fond of it, so I enjoy holding that. The nice thing about it is that when I'm in robes, uh, the children quite like to see this, and I tend to show it to them. And I was showing it, and there was a little tiny girl, quite short and small, came up to about my waist there. Uh, and I had my wooden bishop staff, which is a proper shepherd staff, given me by uh, two of my students when I first became a bishop from Wales. It's a lovely wooden staff. I still use it. It's my usual one I use now still. And so I took the staff and I hooked it very gently, this is not right now, very gently round the neck of this little girl. And I said, I'm a shepherd under Jesus, the good shepherd as a bishop, and such a bishop that I act on behalf of Jesus, the good shepherd. And I put my staff, my bishop's crook, my shepherd stuff round your neck. I did it very gently and slowly as a lot frightened And then I say, and I say to you, come home to Jesus. And she rather liked this. When we were going out of the church at the end of the service, when it was all over, she she came up to me, looked up at me, and said, <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was lovely. Bishop Morris, I could sit and talk to you for hours, and to you, Margaret. You've got such lovely, lovely stories. Um, what would you say you have taken from your years of bishop? What sort of overriding memory or lesson have you learnt uh, in your years as bishop? I think of meeting people under all circumstances, and because Margaret is a guy's trained nurse, uh, and therefore we're always meeting people in need and in sickness and in trouble. I, I, I think it takes me right back to World War II when I was a commando chaplain. That's another story another time. Um, and uh, my vicar had been a chaplain in the First World War, and he taught me to say a lovely thing uh, when I went off as a naval chaplain and a commando chaplain. And when my men were wounded on D-Day, and I landed on D-Day, uh, I used to say to the wounded men, remember, it's trusting Jesus and trusting him all the way. And I have very memories of saying that to various uh, of my wounded men, which is too long a story now. But it meant that always that sense of seeking to bring the person of the living Lord Jesus close to people in need has been the most precious thing, more than the great services and cathedrals and the great uh, pomp and circumstance, the personal care uh, of people uh, as a shepherd.